Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City of York Council Health and Adult Social Care Policy and Scrutiny Committee. It's 5.30, we'll make a start. Um, we have apologies from uh, Councillor Perrett and Councillor Taylor who is substituting this evening. Uh, everyone else is uh, here. Uh, we're not expecting the alarm to raise this evening, so um, if it does, nearest doors there and then out to the right uh, and assemble by the ho hotel around the corner. Um, we're not being webcast tonight, but we are being recorded. Um, executive meeting uh, are sitting, so that's being webcast. So um, we're being recorded and uh, it's expected to be online. Uh, tomorrow, uh, this meeting. Do, does anyone have any uh, declarations of interest other than listed, please? Councillor Mully? It's not a conflict of interest. I just wanted to be as transparent as possible. I've for several years been involved with Food Not Bombs and they've got some recommendations in this report, so I just wanted to be clear about that. Okay, thank you. Nothing else? No? Okay, thank you. Uh, the minutes of the last meeting are pages... 128 um, in, in the agenda. Just a couple of updates from the minutes. Um, there's reference to um, in here of Oakhaven, uh, the options appraisals coming to scrutiny um, in February for expected a uh, meeting in March. Uh, I've just been advised that it's likely to go to executive in April now, so that it will be March scrutiny that that comes to uh, in advance. However, um, Lowfield's going to come forward first. Um, so th 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 that's going to executive in March. So we'll, we'll have a report to us next month on Lowfield. Councillor Manny? Has that um, been confirmed with the responsible officer? Just because it be the same officer presenting the Lowfield report and the Oakham report, just the sake of her not having to come in out of normal working hours, is, would, it just, would it be simpler for it to all come together? In February's meeting? I don't think the... Um, I've spoken to the officer and she's quite prepared to come to both meetings. Um, you need to, if you're doing proper pre-decision scrutiny, you need to have the reports before it goes to executive so you can make comments uh, to inform executive of the feelings of this committee. Um, and the information about Orcave won't be available in, in February. OK. And then... Um, there was reference to um, the Shern Clinic in, in the meetings of the last minute, uh, as members had asked uh, whether the um, services that they, they were intending to provide, whether there would be any, um, any clash, if you like, if you want a better description, with services that are all, already provided. So I've, I've been given a, a statement. So Shern Clinic is proposing to build a new 46-bed modern facility and transfer current services with a small increase in beds to treat patients suffering with complex diagnosis of eating and personality disorders. Shona Clinic is working with commissioners and stakeholders to determine a third mental health service to operate in the new building. In January 2019, Shona Clinic took over operations at the retreat for its two inpatient eating disorder services and dissociative identity disorder service following local concern that they would be closed. Um, a joint letter has been secured with Tees-Esk and Weir Valley's NHS Foundation Trust, who will be operating Foss Park Hotel, uh, Hospital, sorry, uh, establishing that uh, Shern Clinic services are distinct from the office, uh, offer at Foss Park, so that we've, we've been given that assurance. And Shern, Shern Clinic now provides healthcare at four UK lo locations, including York, where it's working in collaboration with other mental health providers. Um, do, do, do members have any, anything else you want to raise from the minutes at all? Okay, if, if you're happy, I'll, I'll sign those later. Um, we don't have anyone registered to uh, speak in public participation, so we'll move to um, first of the agenda items, which is item four, the Health Watch York uh, Performance Monitoring and Six-Month Review, pages 9 to 32, in the uh, agenda. I'd like to welcome Sean um, Balsam, who's the Health Watch Manager. Um, I don't know whether you want to sit at, at perhaps one of the side ones, Sean. Reason being is it's only, you've only been recorded from one side and you'll have your back to it. <laughs> if, you, if you prefer. You can sit wherever you like, basically. Do 
Would you like to give a brief introduction? Um, yes, I think um, some council councillors won't have seen me before, but I know my colleague um, delivered this previously. Um, so, hello, nice to meet you. I'm Sean from Healthwatch York. Um, I don't want to just run through what you've got in front of you, because I'm assuming you've all read it, but I thought it might be helpful to just pull out a few of the sort of bits I think of as either new or highlights that I'd like you to be particularly aware of. Um, so there are new sections in this report from previous times, which includes the responses from um, particularly statutory organisations in response to recommendations we've made in reports. So that first section from two through to the end of page eight is what other people have told us they will do or their, their sort of formal responses. There's also a new section on page nine at the top called personal impact. So here are just two short stories that indicate the difference that our work can make to individuals on a personal level. And I think in many ways, those are the bits that, for me, make the job worthwhile. The, the responses from statutory organisations that say they're going to make some changes to policy or process, great, but these actually tell us what it means for an individual when things change for the better for them. Um, also, a new section is media work on 13. So I think we have an obligation to try and make as many people as possible aware of the work of Health Watch York, but actually we don't often tell you where stuff about us might have appeared. So there's just some links in there about where we've appeared on radio and where stories have appeared in the local press to just make sure you're aware of where we're popping up. Um, there's a couple of stories in there about changes to prescriptions. The report about that will be going to the Health and Wellbeing Board on the 4th of March, but I thought members of Scrutiny Committee might be particularly interested in that in terms of, similarly to the closure of Archways report, this is a change in service that health colleagues didn't feel would be particularly controversial and yet <coughs> has resulted in significant challenges for a number of individuals in the city. So I think it's an interesting thing for Scrutiny to think about, about when is a change a change that we need to think about? And I think what's, I don't want to preempt that report coming out, but what is slightly disappointing is this isn't the first area where this change has been made. And the experiences we're seeing here are the same experiences where it was implemented in other areas where there wasn't work with the community to understand what it might mean for them. So are we repeating the same mistakes up and down the country because we don't understand it's a, it's a thing to change? Um, and lastly, um, just other areas of work that, that we might want to flag up with you now that we're starting to look at for the year ahead. Um, instead of doing a work plan survey, which we've done in the past, what we're planning on doing this year is a year of community conversations. So actually trying to find out what matters to geographical communities and communities of interest around health and social care. So we're not doing our, here's three things that people have told us are quite interesting, what do you think? We actually want to go and find out what people really think about everything in health and social care. So it builds on some work that um, Abby, our engagement officer, and Liz, our research officer, have been doing with um, children and young people, uh, with organisations who support young people in a variety of ways. Um, and that report will also be coming out fairly shortly. So there'll be, that will feed into the Children and Young People's Plan. But it's quite an interesting thing for us to, to actually just go out listening to people rather than having an agenda and trying to find out what we want to know. What do they want to tell us? Um, we're also having a meeting around access to services for deaf people. It was one of the first reports we did. Um, we know that people are trying to make things better. Um, we've had the accessible information standard, um, but actually that issue is still around. So we've got a meeting next week with members from the count, well, with, with um, officers from the council, the hospital, the CCG to start off. What can we do? Um, and we also just wanted to flag with dentistry. We do keep having conversations with NHS England about what's happening with that in this area. Unfortunately, there's been a recent change to NHS choices, so it no longer tells you where a dentist... Um, it no longer gives you a long list with details about whether or not they are taking on NHS patients. 
it just gives you eight closest ones and you have to dip into each one to get an update on what's going on. And a lot of them say no data on whether or not they're taking on patients. So just sort of an early warning, we're going to be thinking over the coming months about what we do about that because it's not getting any easier to find a dentist, it's actually getting harder. So on that note, I'll stop talking <laughs> and just say, would anyone like to ask anything? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. It's nice to see you back. <laughs> um, you. I've got three questions, if I may, and that, that, that'll be my lot, so best to get them out of the way, I think. Um, first one, I'm not sure what, how much you can say about this, but it, it is alarming in a, on page 28 of the Council papers. I think the page number might be different mm. in, in the actual... If you're just looking at your report as a standalone mm. item, but it talks about how the contract comes to an end in March 2020. Since this... Since your report's been submitted, are, mm. are you any closer to a resolution on that? Because that seems pretty close to the brink. And, that, and it's probably not... I'm sure the issue doesn't necessarily lie at your door or maybe someone else's door, but some more clarity on that or an update, if, if, if there is one, would be sure. appreciated. Um, I have excellent news. We were told before Christmas it was very likely to be extended and we have had the official confirmation of extension through today. Well, I think it came through yesterday, but I wasn't in. So, yes, we are going on for another two years. Great. Fancy that. <laughs> That's a good start, isn't it? Um, two questions to go. Uh, the second one, hopefully another straightforward one. Um, I was a bit struck by the... Um, the wording on where it says Abby Myers was successful in retaining our engagement role. Um, is that referring to the staff member's probationary period or something else? I'm not sure if I've misread that on page 30 in the papers. It just felt like a weird thing to read. Sorry if I've missed something. Um, I think... Without wanting to go into too much detail, York CVS overall had to go through a restructure process. Now, because of the situation we were in, all of our Health Watch team contracts at that point were temporary contracts. So as a result, those temporary posts were part of the restructure of York CVS. Um, the excellent news is we have everybody we wanted and um, although there were um, other candidates involved, the best people got the jobs and um, Abby, who has been with us since she was an apprentice, was the strongest candidate for the engagement role and is going from strength to strength. So yes, it is a bit weird. Um, it was something we had to do, but with the extension, they will all move on to permanent contracts. So, subject to funding, obviously, but uh, that's a good thing for me that we won't have to re-recruit anyone to the post they're already doing. Thank you for the, for the clarity. Uh, and, and, the, and the last question, which is much more about sort of end product of what Health Watch do, and I think, mm. for the record, I've always said it, I think Health Watch are one of the best in the country. Um, there's, there's a lot of Health Watch which just sort of dance around the edges, but these guys are, are really quite involved across the board, and that needs to be noted, I think. But um, one thing I've always admired, um, because health and social care services are really struggling for a number of reasons, is your, um, how do I put it, your ability to remain diplomatic um, <laughs> amidst, well, a what a bonfire of services in my view um, but to, to, to drill down on that a little bit I'm looking at the recommendations um, where you've Health Watch have listed recommendations and providers have, or commissioners have responded so page 14 in the council paper specifically I was a bit how do I put it um, annoyed um, so let's say the first recommendation in response at the top of page 14 where you, you've said, consider ways to gather needed information slash data to know if the policy is effective in saving money and improving patient outcomes in the areas outlined in this report. Now, the CCG response just seems to almost half ignore that and just sort of say what they're doing. And I wonder if there's any scope in your future reports when Healthwatch York list their recommendations following the research they've done 
and provide us all commissioners give their response to your recommendations, mm -hmm. would Health Watch York ever be willing to sort of come back to some of those responses and say, well, this is the reason why we're making that recommendation. You haven't quite addressed the point we're raising there. I just sort of think that there's a bit of a standoff sometimes in the recommendation and the response. And it'd be nice to see a bit more challenge, but I can appreciate you can't speak as loosely as some of us might <laughs> on some of our leaflets. I think um, one of the biggest challenges for an organisation like us is to reach as many people as we should and then to make sure that what we hear leads to genuine change. Mm -hmm. I think that, in fairness, some of the reports in this particular phase did not have as, um, as strong an evidence base as we would normally wish, but they were changes to quite specific services where the number of people who would go through that service would be limited and our ability to reach those people without other partners being necessarily bought into that would also be difficult. I think one of the conversations we have had with um, partners around the Health and Wellbeing Board was about how when we're doing pieces of work in future, if partners are bought into the idea of us doing that work, acknowledging that some of the things we have to say to them won't be easy to hear, but that the data that we get as a result is richer and the quantities of people engaged and the quality of information we provide is stronger, then they would feel compelled to respond to our recommendations with a demonstration of how they are going to act. Yeah. So I think here there is a... We are moving forward. This is the first time we've been able... Well, it's one of the first times we've been able to actually say, and here are the responses and this is what's happening. The process in terms of handling those responses is improving. I think there is probably an ongoing conversation for us to have with you as the scrutiny committee about if we get responses that we do not feel give us reassurance that the challenges presented are being addressed. What collectively can we do about that? Because I think... You have some powers, we have some powers. Together we have lots of powers, we can probably do more. So I'd kind of throw it back a little bit to say, we want to work with the system to improve the system, but if there is stuff that comes through to you where you think, I can't see how the system's going to improve from this, what do we then do about it? Because I think together we can probably do a much better piece of work to bring about change. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. A very diplomatic answer, as, <laughs> as ever, but very helpful as well. Um, thank you for that. My, um, I just want to refer to page 21 in the uh, report, as we have it. Um, and I probably missed something, just, just for clarification. With those two, two graphs... Um, mm. The last block there labelled as volunteer. And total, I didn't quite understand how that fitted with the grasp, but it's probably just me. The most important thing is just to recognise the huge amount of volunteer hours that, that is put in by those who volunteer with Health Watch. And I'd want to put on record um, just a recognition of that, a, a, a respect and thankfulness for that, um, along with the question, um, are you looking for more? Is this enough? Are these really as many as you could cope with and sufficient to do the work that Health Watch is, is, is ambitiously doing? Or are you still, even with this number of volunteer hours, looking for more volunteers? Um, the answer actually isn't a straightforward one for this. Um, None of us have a specific remit around volunteer management, and it is one of the ongoing minor headaches that we enjoy, if, if that makes sense, um, in how we properly support our volunteers, acknowledge the vast amount of work they do on our behalf, acknowledge all the places we couldn't be and couldn't get to without their support, um, and make sure that the roles that they undertake are rewarding for them in a variety of ways. Um, we have people going all over the place for us, 
some of them doing things that actually they're not that interested in, but they know it helps us. We try and encourage people to only take on activities that they do actively enjoy, but some people know when we're struggling, they'll just take it on because somebody ought to do it. Um, we all try and do a bit of volunteer coordination around the rest of the edges of what we do, um, and it is tough um, to, to get the most for our volunteers and from our volunteers through what we do. But we are always looking for more volunteers um, because the sheer scope of what we do is to cover everything in health and social care across York. And um, there are places now that I know if we had the right volunteer, we could be regularly providing a presence that means more people hear about us. So um, the sort of the short answer is we're always looking for volunteers what we want them to do at different times will vary. Sometimes um, we have enough people who are willing to come to meetings, but not enough who want to go out to community events. Sometimes we have more than enough for community events and not enough who want to go and talk to residents in a care home. Um, it's, yeah, it's an ongoing challenge. And, you know, if, if I found a, a massive wadger cash down the back of the sofa, the first thing I'd probably do is get a volunteer coordinator but it would mean we couldn't do lots of the other things we do. So we'll continue to juggle it as best we can and hope that our volunteers bear with us when we don't quite get it right and thoroughly enjoy the times when we do. Thank you. And the first part of my... Sorry. The first part of my, my question just helping me to make sense of uh, those bar charts on page 21, particularly... Okay. <laughs> Volunteer and total? Yes. So the, the bar charts just really represent a, a sort of a, a nominal split of the hours that they spend with us. So um, attending Health Watch meetings, um, which is any meeting that Health Watch convenes, so things like our assembly, our annual, our annual meeting, our volunteers' meetings, volunteer drop ins. Health Watch visits are um, enter and view activities, care home assessor work, sure. place visits. Information events are our community champions and engagement volunteers. So it would be anything where we're providing an information stand or an opportunity to come and talk to us at a general information event. Representing is where Health Watch volunteers go to meetings for us to find out what the meeting's about and bring back information for us. Um, staff development, as you can see, there's a limited number of volunteer hours in that because it's where volunteers get involved in staff development activities. So, for example, if I had a meeting with our chair, that would be staff development. And volunteer development, which unfortunately is the word missing off the end, is anything we do with sense. our volunteers to develop them, um, which includes things like one-to-ones, um, training events. So that's, that's what that's all about. I'm afraid when you reproduce them and you're trying to not make them too big, you sometimes lose important okay. words. <laughs> okay, that, that's answered my question. Thank you. Okay. 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 Councillor Kilby. Uh, thanks, Chair. And thanks, Sean. Thanks, thanks for the report. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, page 26. The, um, the table there of... Mm. Uh, complaints, compliments, concerns. Uh, what, what's the difference between a complaint and a concern? Um, the main difference between a complaint and a concern is if somebody tells us that they want to complain and they are going to pursue a complaint against an organisation or they want us to log it as a complaint, it's treated as a complaint. Um, a concern is something where somebody wants to log something with us, they're not either going to raise it formally themselves or they're not going to um, encourage us to raise it formally as a complaint but they do want it logging that they were concerned about it. So it's kind of a, a degree of severity and a, a sort of a person approach to is this something I want to complain about. Yeah. So it could be the same thing but one person wants it taken further and another person doesn't. Yeah. Okay. In terms of the access to GPs, uh, which is the biggest area of um, complaint mm. um, 
for, and you're saying it's been consistent across the six month period. Mm. That, th those figures, do they relate to particular practices or to particular geographical areas? And can those figures be extrapolated across um, the authority to give us an idea of the level of complaints about uh, lack of access to GP appointments in York? I think the, the short answer is these are relating to whichever GP practices people who get directly in contact with us want to log an issue with. Um, when we have done bigger looks into access to GP services, whether as a general survey or whether on a specific issue related to a particular GP practice, um, there is always far more in terms of people who have already made complaints to GP practices. So I think if you combined this with some of the information that the clinical commissioning group held, and as we see the development of primary care networks, when we saw what information they were using as well for their own complaints data, we could probably put together a richer picture if everybody's willing to share their data on that. Um, I think we haven't been able to identify specific GP practices where there is a, a recurring theme of complaints, but you do get little clusters where it's clear people aren't happy about particular issues. And I know my colleague was at a meeting yesterday that some of your fellow councillors, um, you included, um, held to look at particular issues in a particular area. Um, I think it would be naive to say there weren't certain areas where there are bigger concerns, bigger challenges than others. Um, and a lot of it is about the future of what GP practices will look like and what that actually means for individuals living in certain areas. I think one of the things we're quite keen to start thinking about is mapping the journeys to the various places, um, starting with just asking our existing volunteers about mapping their journey to and from their GP practice or other sites that they're being sent to to access services from their GP. So I think just starting to unpick what are we really asking people to do and is this sustainable and is this going to, you know, what do we do if it's not working for people um, is kind of a, a next step for us in understanding some of that. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I was indeed at a meeting last night full of 60 very angry uh, patients who are not happy at being told that they've got to travel two miles to get um, a GP's appointment. Guess what I'm interested in in this figure, clearly it's, it's, it's the outstanding uh, complaint figure on this table, is how much that tells us about access to GP services across York. I understand um, the sort of limitations in gathering data from what will be the primary care networks, the current GP practice, etc. Is there any way statistically that Healthwatch can use this figure to give us an idea of the levels of satisfaction, satisfaction to these various services from uh, people in York? Uh, there has just been a national data set published by, I think it was NHS England, about GP satisfaction, um, which indicates that, generally speaking, satisfaction with GP services is OK, good in most places. I think... <laughs> There is a massive problem when you start talking about how happy people are with GP services, because when you actually ask them after their experience what the GP was like, they're happy with that. When you talk about how you access a GP, they're not very happy about that at all. And again, I'm sort of generalising, but that seems to be the way it's, it's splitting at the minute. I think one of the concerns I have is the accessible information standard was meant to be about health services understanding their population and meeting their needs around accessible information. But we're not having the same conversations with people about travel and transport and the barriers that stop them accessing services. I think I understand that there are huge issues for general practice. I understand it's very difficult to recruit doctors. I understand that the model of primary care has to evolve to respond to where we're at now rather than what it was like in the 1950s. I get that, but I think what we're not doing is taking our population with us, having really good conversations about what services we need where to meet those needs, and then thinking about how we provide it. I think we're thinking more about where would it make sense for service providers to deliver it, and then what do we do with our population who can't get there? And that just feels like completely the wrong way around to me. So the tail's wagging the dog a little bit at the moment. Okay, I mean, I just in terms of 
into the future uh, in terms of these figures. Mm. Uh, I know you, uh, statistics are difficult, but it would be really useful for this committee if this, if this kind of meant something on a population-wide basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's almost... Um, I mean, it, they're useful, but they're kind of anecdotal, yeah. really. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you, if you could put some systems in place so that, or some statistical uh, systems for gathering the information that could then be extrapolated to, to, mm -hmm. to, to the population as a whole. Uh, and just touching on, um, uh, on the other bodies that you rely upon for gathering evidence, and uh, how helpful have they been? Um, that's... <laughs> That's a very good question. I think um, the first thing I should come back to around access to GP services is we did do a detailed report um, a couple of years ago around access to, to GP services. And uh, previous to that, when Unity Health introduced an online triage system, we also did a report about that. So if you haven't read either of those reports and you want a bit of a flavour about some of the things coming down the line in GP land and what it meant for our population, they're worth a read um, and they do give a bit of a richer picture about, they won't necessarily identify individual GP practices but they will give you an idea of the sorts of comments we were receiving, the things that were worrying people, um, you know, where things were working, where things weren't. Um, and I think one of the challenges for us is we could look at nothing but GP services for the rest of time and we could write report after report after report because people always have something to say about access to GP services and it is the most frequently used service in health. It's the thing that every single one of us at some point will go to. So there's always data about that. There's always feedback about that. Um, I think... What I'm hoping from our community conversations is we can start getting into some richer, more nuanced conversations about what the future of primary care really should look like. I think if you look at the recent work we did around the NHS long-term plan, which I know didn't have as much feedback as we'd hoped, but it coincided with PERDA, which wasn't particularly helpful. Um, again, one of the key themes was around what future GP practices should look like, what the future of primary care is. Um, I think... There is an awful lot of work to do to explore people's willingness to use alternatives to GPs, things like nurses, prescribing pharmacists, um, paramedics, as alternatives to GPs if we know that we cannot get enough GPs to cover everything we'd want a GP to do. Um, I think that I'm really hoping that over the course of this year we can start exploring the willingness of our population to think about what alternative primary care would look like and gauge the appetite for that and pull together some rich data on that. Um, but it will be a bit of a work in progress. And as I say, the point of community conversations is to talk about what matters to them. Given what we know, I would strongly expect GP services to come up quite seriously in those conversations, but it's kind of a... We don't want to lead people to a particular place and make them have the conversation about what we want to have. We want to make sure it responds to what they want. But it's very likely it will include GPs. And the second part of the question? You'll have to remind me what it was. Just how helpful have the various organisations been uh, with, the, with your work and compiling this report and giving you the statistics and information that you need? Um, I think genuinely it's, it's an evolving picture. I, it feels a bit weird saying that when we started in 2013 and it's now 2020, but actually the key individuals in the city change, um, the relationships change, the organisations that you're working with, their priorities, their key personnel change. Um, I think in many ways I am more hopeful now than I have been in the past about an understanding of what it could look like if Healthwatch was a vehicle that all partners bought into, wanted to support and would help with to have the conversations we collectively need to have to bring about the best in health and social care. So I don't think we're 100% of the way there yet, but I think we're further down the, the line than we have been before and it does feel like it is getting better. Thank you. Uh, you may have more questions, but I just want to chip in here. 
uh, because it, there was a bit of an overlap with the question I had on, on GP services. Mm. And um, you, obviously, the, earlier on in the report, um, you listed the, the areas that have been the main recent focus, and you've mm. touched on that. Obviously, you've, looked at, you've brought uh, reports to us previously about GP uh, mm. services. Um, it is a continuing theme regarding the access to GP appointments in particular. Um, so I think from, from my point of view, and I, I know the members agree, but I'd like to see this be a continuing area of focus. Um, obviously, you, you may well pick this up in, in, in the conversations you've su suggested yeah. that you're going to be doing. Um, and my question was, what would you say Health Watch can do to help scrutiny um, see whether, for example, CCG initiatives are improving things or likely to improve things for patients? Maybe something to think about. <laughs> yes. I mean, one of the things that I've, I, I raise as a sort of a, a concern of ours and a sort of barrier um, towards the end, just before the table about what staff training and development we've done is we've identified that we do not as yet have good processes for sharing information with GP practices and flagging up recommendations with them. And we had made the assumption that as the joint commissioner of GP services, flagging those up with the clinical commissioning group would lead to them using their systems to share information with GPs. I think in fairness to the clinical commissioning group, their um, ongoing communication with the member practices is a massive challenge for them as well. And I think our additional input into that hasn't been picked up. We have started a conversation with the head of engagement at the clinical commissioning group about how we might work together to improve our routes for sharing information with GP practices and for encouraging two-way sharing of information. So when we're doing work around access to GP services, it is promoted more widely within member practices. Um, we haven't got a solution yet. I think the emergence of primary care networks and the desire to see this sort of smaller population base be served by a, a group of um, practices working together is still an evolving picture. I think it's probably kind of a conversation that we need to have about where scrutiny will be bringing primary care networks in to explain what's going on, how it's developing, what that means for service provision, and what we can do to help kind of gather messages and, and kind of understand what it's meaning for our, pract uh, for our practice populations. We've had a conversation about whether patient participation groups could be reinvigorated across the city and feed into a primary care network-based patient participation group. Um, I think in some other areas um, there have been funded networks that bring people together to kind of share the, the issues that patient participation groups are experiencing and what that means for sort of things at a, at a city or local authority level rather than within individual practices and I don't think we're as far along that process as other areas so I think there's still a lot of work to do in kind of figuring out what that will really look like and how we make sure it has the most impact for individuals on the ground receiving these services. So I'd be very happy to work with you to think about that further. Thank you. Sure. Oh, sorry, don't want to be hogging the mic. Um, I remember a couple of years ago there was a major um, initiative in terms of um, getting people to go for health checks and for smoking cessation. And I'm not seeing anything in the report about that. What, what's happened to that? Has it dropped off the agenda? What's, what's going on with it? Just having a little look at Sharon here. That doesn't mean we wouldn't have a look at them. Um, but actually, we have sort of supported a little bit of signposting around that with a slight blip at one point where we signposted to the wrong thing. But <laughs> I think, generally speaking... Um, we haven't had any feedback about those services um, directly, apart from my partner went for one and thought it was quite useful, which I thought, you know, male of a certain age, interested in finding out how his health's doing, that's a good thing. So I, I don't know how you reached him, but he was very, very complimentary about it. That's the only feedback I've had, um, and that wasn't really in my capacity as the 
manager of Health Watch York. <laughs> so just, just, just as a follow-up to that, if I may, sorry, I did say it'd be quick, but it seems it's not. Um, is, is, that, is there a gap there then? So where there's delivery of services that are provided by local authorities, such, such as um, Tier 1 and 2 obesity interventions, is, is there a gap that you're unable to see the whole thing uh, and to get information on the whole thing? Because, you know, what, what struck me about the uh, obesity interventions was in terms of you analysing how they're working, you couldn't get a whole picture on it really, you know, because you might have somebody who can't take up exercise because they can't walk, for example, you know, um, but there seemed to be no way of knowing if that was a reason that would stop them getting elective surgery, you know, because they can't, because yeah. you, you're not looking at those things because mm -hmm. the local authority provided. Do you need your, your scope to be bigger? I mean, technically that does fall within our remit, but it wasn't the purpose for which we were doing the report. So actually exploring the, the sort of service provision in advance wasn't... We, we weren't analysing the feedback from individuals using those different level services. What we were looking at was overall the experience for people who were being told they couldn't have surgery unless they lost weight. What was it like for them? I think um, there were individuals who had repeatedly not been given bits of advice that might have helped them when they first started going through the process, and that's um, specifically related to when they went to their GP and had a referral. At no point did someone say to them, if you haven't lost weight, this is what's going to happen, and this is where you can go to get help with that. Um, but there were limited individuals that we spoke to, so we only got some... some small-scale feedback about the process and about what they were and were not offered. And it, like I say, you can't really think of that as a population data response. It was a few individual stories which were worth reading because every individual's experience gives us an indicator of what's happening for people in York. But I think um, since that, there has been an increased focus on actually understanding the pathway through... Um, obesity management services and what that pathway would look like for an individual. So I am confident that health and the local authority are working together to make sure that it doesn't matter who provides the service, people are progressing through it, but that wasn't really the scope of what we were doing. Okay. Councillor Clute, before asking you a question, was it, was it linked to this or a separate question? I accept. It's separate. Do you mind if I just put in again? <laughs> um, reason being is actually Councillor Perrot asked me about specifically about smoking cessation last week. And um, I just wonder whether, Sharon, would you be able to join us for a moment at the table? Because you, I think you might be able to help with this. Um, some of the members will recall because it, um, it, it happened prior to you joining the council, but. Um, the, the, there was a bit of a service change around smoking cessation and I just wondered whether we're at a point now where we might have um, a possibility or a, t a suitable time to bring forward some um, relevant information of how that service has been going since the changes. Um, yes, and coincidentally, smoking cessation services was one area that I'd identified that scrutiny might want to take a closer look at. So we're thinking along similar lines. So for those of you that may not be aware, prior to 2016, the council had inherited two smoking cessation contracts from the old primary care trust. One of those was a contract with um, Harrogate Trust, who were providing specialist stop smoking services and smoking in pregnancy services. And the other was with um, some, but not all, GP practices across York, um, who were providing stop smoking services for their, for their own patients. Um, at around the time that we were um, looking to recommission those services, um, we also had the announcement of the National Cuts to Public Health Grant. So we did a piece of work looking at um, what we needed in terms of what our population needed in terms of stop smoking provision and also what was going to be affordable given the cost envelope that we were left with after the, after the budget cuts. 
Um, and so, um, as an outcome of that, um, the decision was made to bring Stop Smoking services into the council, but offer a holistic model through um, health advisors, now called health trainers. Um, so that instead of people having to go to one service for stop smoking um, advice and another service for their NHS health check, um, another service for um, advice around weight management, for example, we wanted to bring those together and offer a more holistic service to um, our residents who might smoke and have a weight problem, for, for example. Um, and so the service has changed in 2016 and it's fair to say has been on a journey since then. Um, so I would agree it's an opportune time to review how that service is, is, is performing. Um, it would be great if Healthwatch could do some customer insight work in, into that as well. Um, and it seems a very timely um, moment to, to, to review that and also um, the scrutiny to be assured not only on the quality of the service but, but actually is it doing what we want it to be doing and is it value for money. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we would we'd certainly appreciate if you're, if you're both able to, to have a discussion and then how best to present that for us to, 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 to look at. Um, that would be very much appreciated. And then um, linking to the elective surgery as well, I, th I think perhaps you both might want to chip in on this. Um, regarding the thresholds for elective, elective surgery at page 14, one of the recommendations uh, was to work in co-production with members of the public and to understand how to support people who have difficulty engaging with weight loss activity. And it mentions that the CCG does not have sole responsibility, but works in partnership with the local authority and uh, the voluntary sector as part of the healthy weight um, steering group. Um, and then, the, then it mentions that the, the public, health te public health teams would need to be invited to comment about their involvement with patients and the public who are involved in weight loss activity. So I just wonder whether there, there are any thoughts you can give on that at this stage. I think, I mean, it does sort of come back to the, the point you were making, which is where services are part of a bigger pathway but sit across different providers, it is quite challenging to work out where the recommendation should be and how you get a shared, bought-into response from partners involved in that. Um, and I think there's possibly some learning for us in terms of the, the mechanism we use to make recommendations about where it sits with two people, two providers to say we want a joint response on this to cover off so that one provider can't say actually that's not us it's them and the other provider can't say no it's not us it's them um, I'm not suggesting that's what happened in this case but there is a certain kind of um, a certain ease when that can be done for providers or commissioners to say actually not our bad um, and so I think it would be really interesting to think about through the healthy weight steering group if there are some issues here we could pick up to just make sure we're confident that collectively we have a response to that that makes sense and that makes sure people who have given feedback about whether or not a service works for them or what might work for them that is helping shape our, our ongoing solutions to it and the, the, the other part of that then is um, trying to establish how best um, your various organisations might try and engage with those who might find, find it difficult to seek help. And I'm, I'm thinking about particularly men who are notoriously bad at seeking help, generally. Yeah. Um, and shift workers, for example. Um, so it'd be interesting to know how, how we're reaching out to people that wouldn't come and help seek help. Necessarily. So, um, I think healthy weight or um, weight management um, is is one of the more complex areas um, where we need to be supporting people. Um, it's a very sensitive issue, 
Um, but it's very important because we know that excess weight is linked to heart disease, stroke, dementia, um, a whole range of, of, of issues. I think it's fair to say that when Healthwatch did this work, what it exposed was that we didn't really have very effective joint working between our evolving health trainer service, which is the local authority response to um, supporting people with excess weight, and um, GPs, and the CCG Commission service. Um, and, and so what I think the Health Watch report illustrated very well, particularly for the Health and Wellbeing Board um, when, when this report was presented, was that that was a gap that needed to be picked up. I mean, I am pleased to say that um, that situation has improved in that through the Healthy Weight Steering Group, which was only established about 18 months ago, um, that brings all partners together. Um, there is now, um, as part of the work of that group, um, a focus on how we can ensure better communication and what we call um, shared pathways, which is just a way of saying there's more effective communication and that residents can be signposted appropriately to whether it's um, a health trainer or whether it's a referral into a T3 weight management service, for example, that, 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 that is required. Um, and we now have a citywide healthy weight strategy, which we didn't have at the time Healthwatch were doing this work. So I think there have been improvements in terms of um, system-wide partnership working. What I don't know yet, because I don't think the strategy and these pathways have been in place long enough, is what difference that's making to people on the ground. Um, and again, it's conversations, I suppose, to have with Health Watch around what might be a good time for the Health Watch to review that, because we need to wait a certain amount of time for these new things to be embedded before we then look to see whether they're working or not. Um, but certainly that's another area of possible scrutiny. And I think kind of looking at all of the information, all of the words that are on this page, actually just saying, we didn't work that well together before this and now we're working better and we have a strategy and we haven't delivered the improvements yet, but we're on the right track to do that, would tell us more than all these words do. So I think that's kind of where I hope this evolves to is we can, where there, there are areas like that, you might not get a detailed response to the recommendation itself, but to understand what actually then happened, that's where I'm hoping we can get to, but it's a, a slow evolving process. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cullick. Thank you. This points I'm going to make are, are entirely different. So before moving on, um, I would just want to um, underline just how important those areas are and the, uh, investigating how, how it's working, isn't working, could be working better is really very important. Um, three very quick things. First, um, when we were looking earlier at the uh, table of... Um, responses in terms of uh, complaints, concerns. There was a column of compliments. <laughs> good to see that, and quite a good number of compliments. I just wondered when I was looking at that, what, what, what happens to the compliments? Where do they go? Are they, are they passed on? Or? Absolutely, okay. and I think one of the most important things when we were establishing Health Watch in York was we're not just a one-stop nagging shop. Um, we're not here just to say that everything's rubbish and nothing's working for anybody because actually even in some of the complaints that we see there are individuals singled out in our city working their socks off to try and deliver the best possible care often in incredibly difficult circumstances I don't think any of us sat around this table are under any illusions that health and social care is a fun easy place to work in these days there's a lot of pressure on those staff um, and I think we always said that one of the things that was vitally important was to acknowledge that hard work, the people who get up every day and try and make a difference to people's lives, improve things, um, service with a smile, <laughs> um, and acknowledging that 
everybody who comes through that door is potentially facing the worst day of their life and how do we try and make it better for people. So we always wanted to do that and every year we do the Health Watch York Awards which acknowledge people who've received a glowing review for the work that they do in the city because we mustn't lose sight of that. It's, it's just too important and if we do get seen as just a place where we tell everyone how it's rubbish, then nobody would want to invite us to anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're not really a fun person to be around. Um, so, you know, we must represent yeah. voices where they're underrepresented, they're not being heard, where change is needed. But we also must celebrate what's good in our city. I'm really pleased to hear that, and I, I agree with everything that you've said. The other couple of things, you referred to the Safe Places initiative and the, mm -hmm. the app. Um, I'm wondering how that's going. I'm wondering, for example, whether there are sufficient, or you regard there as being sufficient safe place, places identified uh, across the city, and not just in the city centre, but across the city, or whether we're still actually looking to identify those, how the take-up is. I know you've made reference here to the, the number of impressions, but, but how is it actually um, working and what might help for that to work better. I'd love to hear a bit more about that. I'd also be, I, I'm, I'm really pleased, I don't, hadn't realised about the stall in Shambles Market. Yes. Um, so is, is that, I'd like to, again, to know a bit more about that, what the future thoughts are about, okay. about that particular okay. uh, presence. And just as an aside, whilst it was great to hear about the presence in so many places that Health Watch has across the city, including with the universities, mm. it seemed to me that an, an obvious omission in that list was your college. And I wonder whether there was, given that that's such an important area in terms of the young people of the city and the thousands of young people uh, who've grown up in York who would be um, uh, part of the York College community, mm. is, is that an oversight? Um, so, start, quite a lot yeah. of things there, but <laughs> I'll start with safe places, first. shambles, mm. thank you. Um, as part of the work that Abby and Liz have been doing around engagement with young people, they have been at the college and actually Abby was studying for her apprenticeship at the college when um, we first came into contact with her. So she has got ongoing relationships with the college and they're not a complete omission but we have agreed we could do more there. So I think as part of the engagement work she's been and I think they're thinking about what they could do on an ongoing basis. In terms of the safe places work that isn't actually led by us we were doing a supportive retweet of my colleague Maria who works at York CVS on that um, but I think what is really rewarding is listening to her tell what's happening in York um, so <coughs> McDonald's are signed up as a 24-hour safe place Vanguard shopping centre recently signed up so I would encourage you to consider maybe hearing from her directly and thinking about what else could be done um, because I think it's a really important initiative and we found that there are safe places in places we didn't realise there were safe places just because of her being around coordinating a response to that um, and we're hoping that through their involvement in this we can drive up publicity around the fact that these places exist um, which I think is, is really important in terms of York feeling like a safe place for everyone who lives here. In terms of the shambles market um, my colleague Emily developed a relationship with Make It York who said part of their remit is to get more people who live in York, who work in York, um, to see that the shambles market is for them and not just for people visiting our city. Um, so as part of that, they were very keen to offer us the opportunity to use a stall there Every Tuesday, we use it the last Tuesday of the month and we manage um, other voluntary organisations using that space on other Tuesdays. So, for example, York Dementia Action Alliance have used it, York LGBT Forum were there today. Um, and I think it's a really interesting and different resource for the city. I think in terms of just being able to have conversations with passers-by about whatever happens to be going on on the stall on that day, is really, really interesting. And even having conversations with the stall holders has meant that we've had some feedback that we definitely wouldn't have got in any other way, um, which has been, yeah, really interesting. So, yeah, we're really pleased with it, and it was brilliant that Make It York thought, I think Health Watch York could do something interesting with this. So we're very grateful to them for that opportunity. Thank you, and it, it sounds like that's likely to continue. Yes, I Great. think so. Okay. 
Thank you. Any final questions? I'd just like to say thank you very much and congratulations again with the contract extension. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item, uh, item five, the multiple complex needs network update, uh, pages 33 to 102. Sorry, Councillor Bob. Sorry. I'm so, so sorry, but I, I have to declare an interest, and I'm really sorry I forgot about it. Just my sister-in-law works for Health Watch. No problem. So okay. I've mentioned it at the last meeting when they were there, but I just forgot because I've seen her name. No problem, Councillor Wolby, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, welcome to Catherine Scott, who's the system change lead for Health Watch York. York. Sorry, Adam. would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you very much. <laughs> Would you like to give a brief introduction? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so hopefully you'll gather from the final information. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> um, you'll see that there's quite a lot of information in the um, in your papers um, that will give you a bit of an outline of hopefully has given you a bit of an outline of what we've been doing. Um, but essentially a bit of a background to the York Multiple Complex Needs Network is that we've been working for about 18 months together with different um, partners across health, social care and criminal justice system um, to, and people with lived experience to think about how we can work better together to improve people's experiences um, who are um, facing these kind of issues. Um, and hopefully you'll gather from the papers by, by complex needs, multiple complex needs, we're talking about people who face severe and multiple disadvantage, so issues such as homelessness, substance misuse, um, offending, mental health problems, um, and so that's what we're talking about. Um, so in, over the last kind of 18 months, the network has had attendance from key strategic leads, um, frontline workers, people with lived experience, people from vol voluntary and community sector. Um, and attendance has fluctuated quite a bit. People from different organisations and projects have joined, um, joined along the way. Some people have dropped out, and it's, so it's been an um, ever-evolving organic network in a way. Um, and we've taken the time to kind of stop and think and try and understand what's going on in the system at the moment, what, what problems, services, organisations the system is facing, so we, we're, we can know where we can make some changes and think about that. Um, so for some of the work we've done, you'll see there's, there's uh, two bits of commissioned work um, around understanding people's experiences and engagement. So we've done a piece of work with social vision around non-commissioned services and community groups experiences. Um, CERTs at York St John University have done a peer research project um, to hear, hear people's voices who, who live with um, and have experience of multiple needs. And there's a newspaper, a network news, uh, which brings together lots of stuff and has got a bit of an overview of, of the network. And we've also been running a systems changes program, which has brought people, um, frontline workers and kind of... Um, service managers together to think collectively and learn a bit more about systems change and systems thinking to equip them with, with different methods of approaching things in their day-to-day -day work. Um, so going forward, um, you'll see in, in the paper that um, the coordination, the funding for the coordination um, of the project um, was being reviewed at the end of December. That has been extended to the end of March. Um, and um, we're working with Lang Kelly Chase to think about the next steps. Um, but it has been agreed or proposed um, that in the next kind of couple of years we continue with Systems Changes Programme um, and the development of a lived experience group. And the network has been working and moved into a stage of um, taking on different different experiments and different ideas into working groups um, as different uh, with with different people across the system working working on those so we've got a group looking at cross-sector hubs so really what what could a hub look like for York for people with complex needs um, and learning from other places in the country where they've got similar work and, and thinking about how we can work collaboratively to bring that together. We've got a group um, looking at doing with, so making sure that 
all developments that are, that are going on are co-produced with people with lived experience um, and making sure that that's really feeding into the system and um, making the change that it, that, it, that it should do. Exploring how we use creative arts. So there's lots of stuff going on um, around um, engagement with the creative industry and thinking about how we can use this uh, around development. There's a co-commissioning group, which is bringing senior commissioners together to think about um, how we design a system that's based on people's needs um, and think about how we, we can work together looking at that differently. We're looking at undertaking a cultural value survey, so looking at the culture and where things are at in the multiple and complex needs system and where people would like things to be and how we can work together to, to kind of transform some of that. Um, and all of this will hopefully be supported with a, um, a continued uh, funding of facilitation and coordination team um, and we'll be working uh, and co-producing in term, terms of reference for this group as well. There are lots of other ideas. Those are just some of the ideas that have come up over the last 18 months. Um, and there's, there's so many ideas and so much already going on, which is, is amazing work, um, which we want to keep, keep drawing on. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Kelly, who's, yeah. Yeah, so I guess when, when me and Catherine got together to, to actually work out what we were going to present to you, as you can see from all the papers, there's been so much. This piece of work has been going on since early 2017, so um, we just tried to give you a bit of a flavour of, of what's going on. And I guess in a sense, bringing this to scrutiny, it, it's for interest. Um, this isn't a funded um, council <coughs> piece of work, although it potentially could be, and there's, there's lots of links to, to the council, obviously, as a major stakeholder in some of the work. Um, it's also, you know, as, as you'll have read through many of the things, this is kind of complex piece of work around multiple disadvantage. This isn't us coming with um, an identified problem and saying, give us two months, we'll come back to scrutiny and we'll have fixed it. Um, we can definitely say that that won't be the case. But in what we've put in our recommendations, it's around just highlighting the, the need for some systematic change and um, obviously trying to make, make you all aware and putting it on your agenda for, for interest as... Um, the, the idea of multiple disadvantage and some of these themes are coming through at many of your other scrutiny committees. Um, and we think we've heard that multiple complex needs network is kind of getting name dropped, but we've never actually come and fully presented it. So that was another main reason for coming this evening. So on page 38, we've kind of identified a few different recommendations we, we would like to, to put to you. Um, they are relatively vague and we would kind of welcome some feedback um, in terms of what maybe your thoughts are um, when we're asking for things like long-term citywide commitment. Um, exactly how that would look is something that, that we're trying to shape through all the learning that we've had. Strategic participation, um, which has been a challenge to date, but we are getting there with that, and uh, permission from senior leaders for, for the staff members and, and wider different people who are working on this to kind of have the time and space to contribute to this as it's, um, it's a slightly different piece of work than the day-to-day the -day job and it's very easy to, it, for it to be a meeting that people might miss, if that makes sense, just because of it, it crossing over so many different areas that people work in. You know, if, if someone just works in housing, they might think, oh, well, I can only contribute a little bit, but what we've tried to do is... Um, I guess, tr ensure that we're getting people from all different areas of the system. And if we are talking about homelessness, for example, that we're not just listening to people who are experts in housing, that we want kind of the whole uh, cross-section of uh, people who are working in this field or people who've got lived experience. So we're getting a richer picture of actually what's going on. Um, so, yeah, I won't go through all the recommendations because there's a, a few on page 37 and on to 38. Um, but we would welcome, like I say, any feedback and happy to answer any questions um, or comments that you have on any of the reports, because we appreciate there was, there was quite a lot of information we shared with you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Taylor. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for the reports. Um, I, I guess I'll start with hopefully a quick question. You mentioned that funding's been agreed to take you to March. Is that right? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, firstly, it doesn't sound like much time at all, and uh, and I'm wondering, is is it is it the Lankley Chase Foundation who giving you that funding? Have they said to you, do X, Y, and Z, and and we can talk about what happens beyond March? It doesn't seem like much time to leave you guys to scramble around and, and do something to secure your future. So um, currently the, the funding has been extended simply so that we can get a funding proposal into Lankelly Chase that hopefully will, will be passed for a two year um, period. So that is, like, in the next few weeks, that should be, um, we should hear whether that's successful um, and we've been told that it's likely to be. So hopefully, um, yeah, it's, it will be going forward. Thank you. And one more for me, Chair. Thank you. Um, this might sound quite blunt, so forgive me. Um, I don't really have a way with words, unlike other members on this committee. Um, this seems, as, as great as it is, and it's absolutely work that needs to be done. I know uh, when, when the council was under scrutiny for the, the deaths of rough sleepers, um, particularly two winters ago, this sort of issue was brought to the fore. People who were very heavily entrenched and with multiple um, issues and, and needs. Um, so it's great that this is being put under the spotlight and that there's people trying to force the agenda on multiple complex needs. But the bit where I fear this might sound blunt is that it seems very third sector heavy. And, 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 as, and, as, and as great as it is that the third sector is leading the way, as it often does, where there's gaps, I wonder if, and I don't mean this to dismiss the work that has been done, but if we're going to get to a point where there's significant tangible change on services that people use every single day, are we going to, is there a plan or an aspiration to get, you know, NHS bodies more permanently involved with this? Uh, the council itself more permanently involved with this, other public sector service providers or even private ones. I, I guess I'm saying to get proper weight behind the stuff you guys are coming up with, you're going, you're going to need that at some point uh, and have those awkward conversations about not just sharing meeting time together but, but pooling budgets and all those awkward things that need to be done to, to get to the crux of these issues. Can you, can you talk to that at all? Yeah, um, I recognise all your points there, and I think um, it, it's, a, it's a valid point in that, you know, we're, we're aware there's things that, this kind of, there's been some quick wins and some small changes that have been able to happen, but some of the bigger goals that we would like to achieve or, you know, the, the feedback that we're hearing from people who use the services, um, they can only be done by... You know, having the right people in the room, and we've heard that heard that a lot, and we've recognised that. And I think um, it's it's quite easy to get working within the sector quite kind of down downbeat about it, and think you know, change around that isn't possible because of X, Y, and Z. Um, I think back to when some of these conversations started back in 2017, and the very thought of getting um, different commissioners in the room together and talking about pooling a budget seemed a million miles away. We now have a group of commissioners made up from CCG Council and other areas who are sat in the room talking about how they can pull budget. So while it hasn't, it's not been achieved yet, and it's taken a few years to do that, it's a big step already, and that's only. It's one part of it. For, for me, it's kind of one of the biggest, the biggest parts of it. Um, but it's, um, it, yeah, it needs some weight behind it, and we, we appreciate that. And um, Lang Kelly Chase are not, don't have a, a presence in York, and they've been scrutinising in some way to say, you know, who are Lang, Lang Kelly Chase? And they've been quite open about it, that they're here to create the space, but they, they don't have, you know, they can't make certain decisions in, in York. It's... Um, you know, that's for, for other people to do. Um, but there, it at least allows the space. And, uh, you know, although uh, me and Catherine might work for, you know, organisations that are um, not in the public sector, we're able to hopefully kind of bring people together, I guess. Yeah, that is, if that wasn't caught, it is a mental health partnership priority. And I do think that um, there has been increasing commitment and involvement from, from um, 
different uh, public sector statutory sector bodies. And I also think it's important to recognise that it does take time and that the voluntary sector and community sector tend to have more flexibility, particularly those that aren't funded through statutory sector, um, to, to work on this and are working with those at, at the hard edge. Um, and it, it takes, there's, there's more um, complex processes that are involved in statutory sector bodies, um, which, but that doesn't mean to say that we, we aren't making progress and it's not worth p keeping pursuing, but it, it takes time and it takes, takes years and I think that's the thing that we're kind of trying to um, encourage people to commit to is that it's a, it's a long-term, it's a, a long-term piece of work, um, so yeah. I think, following on from what, what Callum has, has asked there, I think um, pages 50 to 52, you've got your bulk of your findings. Um, and um, if I'm br being brutally honest, I think a lot of these we could have almost anticipated um, to some degree. So with like, access to good and timely mental health support, good long-term relationship with one worker, safe place to recover, good quality aftercare, and, and so on. Um, they're, they're all things that we would expect, and it's, this has obviously been a very big piece of engagement work. So what I'd like to see is the next stage, if, assuming you, that you have the funding, is um, uh, really not so much of the engagement, but looking more at um, how, we, how we can understand what's actually changing now because of this work. And, uh, and what's likely to change and when it's likely to change. And um, so actually getting some tangible results from all this work that you've done already. So that, that's what I'd be most interested, interested to see next. Yeah, and again, we, you know, we agree with those comments. I, I, and I think in reading some of the reports, I think one of the important things to highlight is, and this isn't me uh, being critical of, of any other work that's been done in the past, but I think a lot of engagement work that goes on in terms of survey monkeys or people attending events or making comments, it's kind of, you know, members of the public who would do that, this has, that information and feedback isn't gathered from somebody who's been rough sleeping on the streets, somebody who's been... Um, you know, through services for years and years and years, who particularly entrenched in services or, you know, has had, um, or has completely disengaged with services, those individuals are not likely to sit at the computer and fill out a survey monkey and tell us how great or how not great our services are. So this work had to be done to talk to the right people because rather than it being anecdotal, we've, we, we can all kind of make comments what we think about different services or, or what we kind of judgments about, you know, what... Um, you know, homeless people think of A and E, or you know their views on the police. Are, but this was actually properly listening to people, and it wasn't. Um, and it, I think the way we've done it, it was the people who were asking the questions. It was quite important that they were, they were their peers, or there were people who were, you know, they were sat down on the street with them while they maybe were still under the influence or something. So it was it's kind of proper research, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but that takes time to do as well. Um, and now we've got that, we're at the, the next stage of obviously um, taking this to the network. And that's why it takes time, as it's not just me and Catherine saying, right, OK, next we're going to have a co-commissioning group. Next we're going to do this. Because that would go against everything we're trying to do in getting everybody involved. You know, I've got my ideas on what I think should happen with services and to help multiple disadvantaged, you know, Catherine has hers. We've all got our own views on it around the table, but it's about trying to get a shared view from everybody, um, which the most frustrating thing is how, how long that takes to, yeah. to get that. So, yes, I guess from your comments, we, we're hoping for, for some kind of change next, and I think that that's what we're seeing as, as the groups form, and we're getting the, the different membership of people involved in those groups as well, so it's not just you know, the, the yeah. good-hearted people in the city who, who've been wanting to do this for a while. It's those people and people who are able to make decisions, people who hold the purse strings, and people who've actually been through the services and, and know them kind of inside out. I think it's certainly to be commended in the, the approach you've, you've taken in doing that. Um, so 
I think it's, it's all our responsibilities, I guess, to make sure that we get something done from, from all the research you've done. I think um, one thing I'd just like to add to that as well is the, um, how difficult it is to measure um, the ripple effect of, of starting the conversations, of bringing people together in a room who've not sat together and had those conversations from different services, different commissioning strands. You know, it's sitting here and having these conversations and beginning to have those conversations themselves can make change and can affect the way that signposting from one service to another happens and awareness of what is out there and the appropriate way to support people. Um, and I think that, that's a, that those are real, real effects that are happening and are Im impacting people, but they're, they're, they're hard to measure. So I think that, yeah, we also we want tangible evidence-based um, effects but th there are effects going on in the conversation even the fact yeah the fact that we're here talking about this shows that there has there that things are are making progress so, yeah. thank you any further questions members no okay. council could be <laughs> My question is really around, around that um, issue. Th thanks for the report. Thanks for all the great work that you've been doing. Um, it's co it get, gets to the point, though, where do we go from here, doesn't it? You know, and so clearly, you know, if there's an issue in York with um, people having their belongings removed, what's the level of engagement we're going to have with the police? You know, if there's an issue in York um, where people are stigmatised by um, council officers, What's the level of engagement that we need to have uh, with the council if we are going to bring about change in these areas? So that's my question to you, really, is, you know, I understand and totally support the need to involve uh, all the people who've been involved so far and to take them with you. But clearly, how do we then get to the decision makers, to the purse drink holders, as, uh, as you call them, uh, to get them to start to change their behaviour? Because I could ask you about the budgets and stuff that are in here, but I think we'll leave that. For, for now, so you know the things that don't cost great deals of money to change. How do we get those people to start to change the organisational behaviour where they are? That was a tough one. Yeah, and I think this is um, this is why it's been a, a challenging piece of work. So um, you know, in my day-to-day -day job of changing lives, managing homelessness services, when we have have an issue, we can try and resolve it, put it right, get the evidence, change things. Um, we're in control of that, whereas with this, it's, it, because it cu cuts across so many things, it's not just going to one organisation, it's trying to go to two or three, and it's trying to um, manage different personalities, it's trying to <laughs> kind of be the, the in between the voluntary and, and uh, statutory sector. So it's, it's been trying to look at different pieces of work and seeing where there is an appetite to change things um, and also look at who wants to do that as well and who wants to take a lead on that and I think that's where we're at now with the kind of the groups and the nominations that we had through the network there's you know there's a real appetite around doing something around some some further research there's the the co-commissioned groups where people said no these are the bits that we want to work on I think for some of the smaller things that are are picked out around, you know, some, for example, the one, the example you gave about someone's belongings been been moved. That's about sharing the responsibility of. Well, actually, we have services in York. We have very good services in York, who who are commissioned to do certain things, and it's almost a a reminder of of that piece of work. But what can we add to that, if that makes sense? And I think that's where it's the not so much the actual doing of the commission service, it, it's the style and the way in which we do things around trying to be, um, you know, more trauma-informed in, in the way that services work and kind of the, just the, I think it's the general kind of attitude towards individuals who are, who have, who, you know, faced with different, higher support needs. Um, so it's really hard to sit here and think, right, we've got a list of ten things that people have highlighted that they would really like to see change in the city. I, I can't make those decisions. I can on behalf of the organisation that I work for, but it's, it's up to others to take some responsibility. And I guess what we've tried to do with this is highlight it, and we had the event back in November to kind of highlight a lot of the good work that goes on with services, but also then the other bits of work that's still 
still need to happen. Um, and I think some of it is still just in the, the early stages of talking and trying to build the relationships and a lot of the, the myths that exist in the city around who's responsible for what and um, which services are good, which services are bad and why, why those kind of myths exist. Um, and as I said before, all of that takes time. And I feel like I've not really answered your question either now, um, but it was a tough question. <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess what, what, you, what you're going to need is champions, as I think your call from the report spoken about, in, each, in those organisations. You know, you need champions in the police, you're going to need champions in the CCG. You know, we, we've got a situation where, um, uh, where there used to be uh, consistency of GP uh, practices for people who were who, who are homeless, that that's, that's gone, you know. So it, the, these are the difficulties that, 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 that we're facing. You know, you need champions in benefit system, you know, are, are champions in, 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 in the council to, to bring about this kind of change. It's just kind of, I suppose what I'm giving you the opportunity to say, is there anything that we can do to help you on that journey? Um, so one thing to say is we've got representatives of all of those organisations who are part of the network. So that's, that's an important thing. And it's also recognising our own and those individuals' um, ability to influence and the power that they hold. So it's, it's all of us using our voice and, and challenging the stigma and the discrimination and making it an issue. So I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's what can we do as individuals within our organisations to, to kind of influence this and where people who might not be seen as necessarily holding any power in an organisation they, they stu do still hold power just simply by who they work around, who they work with, the conversations they have. Um, and it's, it's trying to um, enable people in, in any position to, to use that. Um, yeah, I think. Sure. Uh, and just, just some just things that uh, it struck me that weren't in the reports that uh, I thought might have been, but it might be good reasons why they're not. Um, is the in terms of um, employer involvement, so sort of pathways for people um, into work from the position that, that they're in now. You know, you know do, you'd have to have the right kind of employer, the right kind of attitude, and all the rest of it. But those people, you know, those people do, do exist. Um, and also, no mention of home first. You know, sort of house or housing first, or whatever you want to call it, in terms of making sure that people's basic sort of needs are taken care of, and and that that wasn't really prioritised by stakeholders and that, whereas it's the flavour of the month in local authority circles. So just any thoughts on either of those points? Um, yeah, I mean, we were obviously what's come out in the reports is, is what people have highlighted, so we can only go with that. Um, I guess in, in reference to, to Housing First, um, Housing First in the city came about through this piece of work. Um, it's just we've maybe not kind of highlighted that because it, it did happen some some time ago um, but yeah it's uh, it is definitely flavor of the month it has been has been for a while um, and the the council of uh, housing team are members of uh, the network and have been looking at different you know how they can be involved as have um, members of the human rights um, from from the university who are kind of passionate and doing the research on um, Housing first as well, so it's it's not that it's not not included within this. Um, it's um, it's just that it's maybe not not been flagged up as as much as as it should have been in the report. Any final questions, members? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the to the work plan at the. Uh, Back of the agenda 103 to 106. Um, 104 specifically for the next month. Um, so, um, in addition to the items for February, then we'll we'll have a, an appraisal for uh, Lowfields, all the persons accommodation ahead of it, going to exec the following month. And March, we'll have the Oakhaven options appraisal ahead of going to exec in April. Um, is there anything else we need to... Not at this stage? Not that I'm aware of. Um, anything else members want to raise from the work plan at all at the moment? Okay. 
Um, sorry. Um, in terms of what we talked about earlier, um, smoking cessation and health checks and that sort of thing, in what form is that going to come back? And rough time scale? Um, I don't know whether you're able to... to obviously, Sharon and, and um, Sean will have a conversation about uh, the smoking cessation. Would you have any idea, roughly, when we might expect something? Yes, please, yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Um, we've already had some discussion about this this afternoon, but um, I thought Scrutiny might be interested in considering whether you wanted to look at um, a number of services that have come in to the Council to be provided since 2016. Um, and these are areas of st statutory service provision. So we've already talked about stop smoking services. Um, what we know about stop smoking um, in York is that even though we have a lower number of people who smoke um, compared to other similar cities, the inequalities gap is wider in York than in other areas. So our service is um, not being a, as successful as it should be in tackling those really hard to engage persistent smokers. Um, and there are also some concerns around how well we're doing with pregnant smokers. Um, and um, I wondered if those are areas that scrutiny might want to look at in terms of um, what's, what do those services look like within the council? Because York is a bit of an outlier in, that in other areas. It tends to be the NHS who's providing these services. So people do look at York and say, well, you've got them in-house, how effective are your services being and what are you doing to improve them? So stop smoking is one that we've already looked at. Um, NHS health checks is another area. So these are the health checks offered to um, healthy people aged between 40 and their 75th birthday. Um, we have a fairly low uptake of those checks um, in, in York. And one of the reasons I raise that is because um, when you look at our population health data, even though um, when you look at the whole of York, it, it looks pretty good compared to other areas, we know that we have a widening life expectancy gap in men. So we talked about men earlier. And so um, one idea Scrutiny may want to consider is to do a, a, a bit of a look at what we're doing around men's health. Um, and we've talked about the health trainer service, we've talked about smoking, we've talked about obesity, health checks today. They are all areas particularly important for men's health particularly men's access to um, screening programmes, for example. Um, and so um, that, that's another area that Scrutiny might want to take a, uh, take a look at, um, particularly as the trend um, in men's health particularly is going in the wrong direction. Um, the other service, then, is the health visiting and school nursing service. So... Um, uh, again, York is not the only local authority to employ our own health visitors and school nurses, but there are only a handful. Um, so in Yorkshire and Humber, um, Barnsley is another local authority um, that, that directly provides these services. And um, North East Lincolnshire, although their model isn't exactly the same as ours. So... Um, Health visiting in particular is a statutory service, so we are monitored by Public Health England in relation to that. And health visiting has a key role in terms of the council plan and delivering, um, uh, ensuring that every child has the, a, a good start in life. And so that is another area 
where um, scrutiny might be interested um, in, in looking at that as well. Um, similarly, childhood obesity, we're heading in the wrong direction. So we have more children um, who are measured, uh, way, uh, their height and weight is measured in year six. We're heading in the wrong direction for that. We are obviously through the Healthy Weight Active Lives strategy trying to do something around that, but that's another area where performance um, doesn't seem to be uh, progressing as, as quickly as it should do. And then widening it a bit out, outside of public health services. One of the issues that comes up again and again, and we've touched on it uh, as well as part of the multiple complex needs discussion, is um, access to primary health care provision for homeless people. So not just rough sleepers, um, but you know homeless people who may be in temporary accommodation or hostel uh, accommodation. And by primary care, we particularly mean GP and dental provision. Um, and I think Councillor Kilbane earlier mentioned some changes to the primary health care provision um, uh, for s some of uh, those groups. Um, this is, again, quite a complex partnership issue. Um, but in terms of setting the scope of that that would be manageable as far as scrutiny, you might just want to look at G access to GP provision, um, for example. Um, so those are some of the areas that, um, from a kind of my perspective as, as, as DPH, I suppose I would highlight as areas that as a committee you might want to look at. Thank you. That, that's a very, very helpful. Um, probably more than I anticipated you were going to suggest, but we're talking specifically about smoking cessation there. Um, I'm just wondering how, how best we look at this. There's a, a lot of different areas there. Um, some might have some overlap. Would it some kind of general public health um, review or reports that might, we might want to look further into aspects from that, perhaps? Um, yes, um, that might be one area where you could have um, an overview report that um, gives you um, perhaps a more granular understanding, a deeper understanding of where we are with some of our public health services, um, which ones um, are going well, and you know where where the, the 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 trend in terms of health outcomes are improving, but those areas that we're not doing so well at, that as a scrutiny committee you might actually want either to receive a more detailed report around some of those, or you you might decide that you want to do a bit of a deeper look. Um, stop smoking being perhaps uh, an obvious one uh, around that, given that, um, that concerns about that have already been raised. So I'm more than happy um, to do that, which might give you, um, as a committee, um, a, a better um, kind of view on some of those areas that you might want to focus on in more detail. I think that'd be re really useful. Um, as you counsel, Millie, one of the questions was what kind of... Uh, expectation in terms of when we could expect something coming forward now there's a lot of a lot of areas there and I'm imagining it would take some time to prepare all of that but I don't know perhaps you can tell me different but is 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 the smoking cessation one something that we could see sooner than the others or it, it as it's been noted is there an area of concern so all of the data and the information is available um, so it wouldn't take that long to pull it in, into a report. Um, that the committee might want to see as as draft initially, I suppose, to say um, is, is is the report providing you what what you need. Um, okay. The problem with data is it sometimes raises more questions than answers, doesn't it? So um, it, I don't know when's the next. Committee meeting. 
I would suggest that would probably be looking later than that because I think with the number of items we've got for next month, I think it's going to be quite a substantial meeting. Bearing in mind that we're, we're adding on to that the uh, So the 19th fields. of March then would probably be more realistic. And if as part of that report you want to have a, a bit of a deeper focus into the stop smoking work, we, that, we can do that. That's, that's, that's not a problem. So we could do an overview report and then a more detailed look into stop smoking. That yeah. sounds very helpful, members. Agreeable with that? Yeah. Councillor Mulley? Um, I think that usually if there was quite a large policy change or a new service or something like this where it's been brought in-house from NHS to council, we'd want to look at it, look at how how well it's going and look at the progress, usually after six months or a year. And I think that because these are specific services that the council should be providing, I think they do need to maybe look, be looked at on their own, especially with something like smoking cessation, where I mean, you've explained what a huge area is. And I think it was, I think it was at my first, first health and health social care scrutiny meeting back in June, we had some figures on um, smoking and pregnancy, and we had kind of overall figures for the city. Um, I remember being quite surprised at how high the figures were. And then when we looked a bit more closely at the variations in different parts of the city, I can't remember what the exact figures were, but I think it was nearly kind of 20% variation or something in the rates of smoking and pregnancy. And um, it seemed to um, match quite closely with, if you look at a geographical map of kind of um, multiple deprivation, it did quite closely. So I don't know if the figures are there of not only the rate of services being taken up and people who do take up the services, how successful they are, but also looking at if there's certain demographics or areas of the city where they're being taken up less or being less effective, or if there's certain people who the services maybe aren't so well um, designed for, if there's some areas where it's being very successful and there's other areas where it isn't. I think it's quite, probably quite a large piece of work to look at all of that. Um, and I think if it was part of a bigger report, it would end up being a really, really colossal report. I think, um, uh, I mean, you're right. If we were going to look them all of them together, what we could provide um, is, is an overview that would give the committee um, a, a better understanding of, of, of what's going well. Well, A, what services, are, uh, are, 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 what public health services are provided and also what are going well and what's not so well. The smoking in pregnancy one is um, a really good example where even though as a council we may commission and, and provide that service, the success is dependent on the system. So it, it, we can only have an effective council-led service if there's partnership working with GPs and with the midwives at the hospital, for example. It's, it's a little bit similar to the discussion we had around weight management services earlier, that if one part of the system is trying to address it and the other parts of the system aren't, we'll, we'll fail. Um, and there are issues with the smoking and pregnancy pathway um, and, and that's an area that scrutiny might want to look at in a little bit more detail and, and maybe invite, uh, you know, the chief executive at York Hospital Trust um, and, and, and the CCG to comment on what are they doing to support those pathways and what are they doing to ensure that pregnant women have the right support. It's, it, it's not just a council issue really so that's that that's just an example of how complex some of these issues can can be I, i'm happy to do whatever the committee will find most useful um you know can provide the information in lots of different ways it's got to be and i'm happy to work with the committee in terms of what you would find most mo most helpful this tons of data and tons of information um, but it's it's kind of whether that that needs to answer the questions as a committee you want to ask sorry i uh, <laughs> i don't know how helpful that 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 is really but you know if you wanted to have a detailed look at stop smoking 
and, an, and just an overview report of the other areas that might help you then to focus on any other areas you wanted to look at in more detail. That can certainly be ready for the March meeting and um, might help take the committee further forward in, in terms of any other deep dive work you might want to do. So in essence, it will be two reports, one more focused on the smoking and then a separate one as a general overview on other public health areas. Members happy with that? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, what would be really useful to us as well is if, um, if you could reference health inequalities. So it's going to be something that we're going to be looking at in, in greater depth in terms of the um, sort of the poverty review across the city. So, so that would be very useful. And also um, just making sure that we are covering the, um, the council plan priorities as well. So all of those covered. And um, while we do want to know what we're doing well at, of course, we're most interested in where we're failing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, if there's no other questions on the work plan, oh, sorry, Council Pearson. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> i just make um, a possible suggestion. Feel free to shut me down. Um, February, we've got the second quarter finance performance monitoring report. March, we have the third quarter. Can I make a suggestion that we merge those and have a second and third quarter update in March? It, it may, that may well happen. It depends when the third quarter finance report goes to executive, because we get it after it goes to the executive. The reason why the second quarter is in February is because it was deferred from December yeah. because of the elections, and then deferred in January because um, the January committee meeting was before the executive meeting, and these figures go to the executive before the release to scrutiny. So, if it's all possible, it depends on the publication date for um, executive for um, March as to, as to whether we can get that report in February. Or well, it might make more sense potentially. I, mean, I think it's a sensible suggestion you've made. We could look at six months in one go rather than because some of it's going to be a bit of repetition, I think. Uh, two, in two consecutive months. Is, is that things like that? I have, have spoken to people from the. Um, who prepared these reports, and that's what we're looking towards doing. Right. As I say, I couldn't put it, I couldn't put it definitely because we're looking at the executive dates when, it, when the reports get to executive. But all being well, um, we should get them in February. Right. And so, and so okay. it will come off the March agenda. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So this, the second question was: with the six monthly quality monitoring report for residential, nursing, and home care services. Perhaps that too. Could be deferred since it's only five months since we had the last one. I'd, I'd, maybe the, the, the last one was already late, I don't know. I'm just thinking we've, we've spent 45 minutes on each agenda item tonight. Well, we'll, have, thinking, we'll, it, we'll certainly have to be a it, bit more is it worth limiting. Getting two or three items on each agenda so that it's a little bit more even and we can actually look properly at each issue. Just a thought. Um. Well, obviously, we're having low fields, the low fields report next month as well, so it might be that it would make sense to have that on with that. Um, I don't know what members feel generally. I'm happy to go with general view. Councillor Melly. I agree <clears throat> that the agenda for February's meeting is looking quite full, but I think that there's still some of the things missing from the plan, so March and will end up being full as well. So I think. I think they're both going to end up fairly. Yeah, because I mean, meeting. what's not on here yet because we haven't got a date is yeah. when the um, poverty, health, and quality subgroup are going to have to bring a report at some point. That will be February or March. So there's a, there will be other things to add to the agenda. And I think every month is going to get full, and if we start postponing things, it will just up to snowball. Today you've had, you've, up to today, you've added law fields to the February meeting. And you've added uh, public health overview and smoking cessation and orc haven to the March meeting. So they're both going to be fairly sizable. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's, I think that's it in terms of the, the meeting. I have no other items to raise this evening. Obviously, members, uh, several of you who were part of the uh, corporate review task group will be staying behind and Sharon's kindly agreed to stay behind to, to give us some pointers in terms of 
uh, how we, we might set uh, or what, what topic we might look at specifically for the health aspect of it um, and setting a remit and um, obviously that will be a closed meeting in terms of it won't be recorded. But yeah. 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 Thank you very much.